Okay, we are back on the second half of this morning, which uh, is going to be step one, behavioral science. And uh, the speaker here is from uh, Texas Tech, uh, Dr. Paul Dowdett. He is an associate professor of uh, clinical pediatric in the division of uh, pediatric at Texas Tech University, uh, Lubbock. So uh, he received his PhD from uh, Florida, and then uh, after that, uh, he moved to Texas Tech and uh, became a faculty there at the uh, division of uh, uh, pediatric. And uh, he's been helping us with the USMLE on uh, behavioral side, which is uh, not taught in Thailand. So this is something for you to learn on uh, behavioral science because there's going to be a lot of questions on the USMLE step one. So uh, please welcome Dr. Uh, Paul Doubted, please. Good morning. Um, I have been able to be a part of this uh, conference this time on several occasions before now, um, but I um, have a, the great honor of being able to talk a bit about behavioral science, and um, we'll be doing that. And I want you to, to know I've got a lot to go over, but I can't go over all of it. However, you will get uh, all that I will present. Um, and so it, I would prefer, if you don't mind, uh, rather than taking a lot of notes, I want you to listen, okay? Because as we've talked on several occasions this week, um, one, of the most, one of the most important things, I think, for you to focus on is conversational English. All of you are very, very bright, right? You're very smart, okay? And so the science areas um, you will do well in, and you do well in. You can do well in the behavioral sciences as well. However, I think one of the most challenging things for you as non-English speaking is speaking English conversationally. Okay, Han and I were talking before, and I asked him, his English is very good, and he functions, and he has to function in English, not just English, but Texas English, okay, which is a little different, um, and he has to function in Texas English all the time, because he's, he's a professor um, in the internal medicine department at my, at my medical school. Um, and so it's important that you continue to not only learn information, but that you continue to practice and really work hard at conversational English. And the way you do that, and I was asking Han how he did it, and one of the ways is by listening to um, American TV, okay? Cartoons, sitcoms, football games, whatever you can. Just listen to, to people talking English conversationally. It's also important, I think, if you meet um, foreigners who are from uh, England or Australia or America, to talk with them about whatever, okay? Because that will help improve your English as well. And one of the challenges, I think, uh, that foreigners such as yourself, when you take the USMLE in the area of behavioral sciences have, is that um, behavioral sciences area is, is more specific to America and Western culture, okay? I have been coming now to Thailand for the last 15, we've been doing this 15 or 17 years, and I think I've come now five times. And I've been to your wonderful, beautiful city of Chiang Mai, this is the third or fourth time. And anyone who knows me here very well will know that I like Siladon. And so every time I come to Chiang, Chiang Mai, I have to take my wife back a lot of Siladon. And I've got my box out there because I'll be leaving later today. Anyway, I very much appreciate what, what you are trying to do. You're trying to further, um, further your ability to come to America or the UK or, um, to further your training. And so my, one of my suggestions is in terms of just generally conversational English, really do what you can to become better at conversing in English. And number two, behavioral sciences, you're going to have to just commit to memory to some degree, okay? Because so much of it has to do with things specific to my country or Western culture, 
all right? For example, um, currently I have, uh, well, this last month, I am the, uh, the coordinator for what is called the developmental rotation in pediatrics. And I'm in the Department of Pediatrics, and I've been there for about 20 years. Um, I am a psychotherapist. I'm not crazy, okay? But I'm a psychotherapist. I work with people who, who are struggling with things. Either I work primarily with children and teenagers. Uh, one of my little six-year-old patients called me a talk doc. Okay, he said, oh, the talk doc. I like to go talk with my talk doc. So that's what I am. So I talk. Um, and, and I think it's important that you realize that to understand behavioral sciences, you're going to have to get into it, and you're going to have to commit things to memory because it's about my country, and there may not be similar um, agencies or similar situations or sim similar programs in your country. Okay? And so we are going to touch on some of these. And, and Dr. Decha uh, Sutigan, that may be close, I'm, I'm working to try to improve my Thai. But Dr. Somkid said, you have bad Thai tongue. So anyway, I'm trying, all right? Um, uh, Dr. Decha is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And so he'll be coming this afternoon at 1 o'clock to talk about psychiatry. Some, obviously, behavioral sciences has a lot to do with um, psychiatry as well as other things. And so I'm going to focus on any number of things to give you an idea about what you need to begin to commit to memory and, and understand. And as I said, all of, the, all of what I've done, I've got um, 50 questions, and they're all funny and interesting and um, hopefully not too, hopefully very straightforward. But you will have both of these um, in the DVD. So I want you, don't take so many notes, okay? Listen, okay? And I will try, I will try to not talk too fast, but I'm going to not talk real slow either, okay? I'm going, we are in a conversation, and I will talk as if I were, you and I were at Starbucks. How many like Starbucks? Starbucks? Come on, let's see your hands. I love Starbucks, okay? So, oh, good. So if Pu, Pu, Pu Yi and I were at Starbucks, that's what we would be doing. We would be talking, okay? Is that close, Pu Yi? Or Pu Yi? Or Pu Yi? Okay. I'm learning that there's shortening and lengthening. All right. Um, so I want to, as if we were at Starbucks having a conversation about um, my country about training about behavioral science okay so listen um, before we get to the slides um, I was telling you that I am a I'm the coordinator for the developmental rotation and last month in October my uh, my resident that spent the month with me uh, was is from the Sudan in Africa and he in Africa the Sudan he's Sudanese um, he did his uh, undergraduate in Sudan. He did his uh, medical training in Sudan. He came to, to Lubbock, to Texas Tech, four years ago. He did a family medicine rota uh, residency. He completed that. And then he decided he wanted to do a pediatric residency. So he's now with us. And he spent a month learning developmental behavioral pediatrics with me. Okay? And so as I was preparing to come and talk today, I asked Malik, his name is Malik, um, I, I said, Malik, tell me what, um, what, what was difficult for you about the USMLE in terms of the behavioral science area. And he gave me a few pointers that I want to pass on to you, okay? Um, first of all, what he said was, you, you need to know about the ethical issues that have to do with the practice of medicine in my country. Okay, now what do I mean by that? And I asked him that. For example, he said you need to know about issues surrounding dying and death. For example, living wills. Okay, who has, who has the power to consent for treatment? Okay, in my country, um, 
a, some, a, a person under the age of 17 years of age cannot go and get treatment without their parents' consent unless they are unconscious. Okay? So you have to know about these issues. Um, also, I work with children and I talk with children. And I have to be very aware of if the parents are divorced, I have to be aware of who has legal custody of that child. Because otherwise, I may not be able to talk with the child if I don't have permission or consent from the legal parent, legal guardian. Um, also, in my country, there is abortion at, upon request. And so you have to know at what age you can give consent. A, a woman can give consent to have an abortion. Okay. Um, it's very important to learn about our, the overall, our overall health care system. Because my, I, I have, I've had some conversations with some um, Thai physicians, and I've gotten to know just a little bit about your system. And our, our medical providing system and yours is a little different. But it's important that you know about the, the, our system in particular. And, and unfortunately, it may very well change shortly because of what's happening in my country. Some of you may be keeping up with what's going on. But know the overall American health care system. Um, also, review uh, the psychological diseases or disorders. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 4th edition, are you aware of that? Okay, I hope you are. If not, um, find out about that, that book. That is, that is my diagnostic categories for psychological disorders or difficulties. Okay, and it, and it, for example, major depression. Okay, and then it gives the criteria to be diagnosed. You know, if, if you, for example, have a bacterial infection, okay, I send the, your blood out to a lab, and they send back, you have a bacterial infection, right? No big deal. I mean, it's pretty, they either say, yes, you do, or no, you don't. In my field, it's a little bit more difficult to diagnose depression, uh, anxiety, schizophrenia, um, adult, con I mean, children's conditions such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Because some of these may not be so significant in this country. Whereas in my country, they may be very significant, and it's important that you know that. Um, one, I, I talked to my friend about, okay, if you, I asked him about the clinical skills exam that he took, and I think he took it in Atlanta. And I said, okay, tell me about that. How, how difficult was that for you? What were the challenges? And he said, number, he said, number one, he, he probably initially made it more difficult for himself because he was worried, he was anxious. You know, how am I going to do? Is my English going to be okay? Am I, am I going to show that I know how to do a physical exam? And that sort of thing. And he said after the first patient, what he realized is that he knew how to be a physician. Just like all of you who are learning and are physicians, you know how to be physicians. You know how to do exams and you know how to find out what is wrong with your patient and how to help your patient, okay? So trust that. And that's what Malik said. He trusted what he knew, and the clinical uh, skills exam for him was, or assessment was very, actually, much easier than what he initially thought. Um, also, for example, there are two agencies in my country that protect children and that protect the elderly, older people, okay? those that are older, older than 65. For children, we have what is called Children's Protective Services. Okay, each state in my country has that agency, Children's Protective Services, that is responsible for making sure that children are not abused, either physically, sexually, or mentally. Okay? There's also what is called the Adult Protective Services. And that agency is charged with protecting the elderly to make sure that they are not abused or hurt as well. Okay? So those, those two examples are examples of agencies in my country. 
You may have them as well. I don't know. But I do know that those are very important pieces of information to know. Because, for example, since I work with children, if a child, if a let's seven or eight-year-old comes to me and I'm talking with the child without the mom or dad present, and the child tells me, um, I, I, my, my uncle is beating me or my dad is hurting me. I have to tell the authorities, okay? I cannot keep that private. So it's important. That, that's an example of the specific agencies in my country that may not exist here or in other countries. And you have to know about them because it's vital, very important. Um, all right. Now, uh, we will have opportunity for questions at the end. And I, I will hope you ask them. Like I said, I want to go through uh, what, what are more, I want to get, go through important information that I think you should commit to memory and know and make sure that you know. And then we will, we will begin looking at some of the questions and answers. All right. And if you, as I said, if you'll hold your questions until the end, um, in about, 30, about 20 minutes, we will have a break, a very brief break, and then we will move into the, we will go full force into the lunch hour. Okay? All right, um, so let's begin. Okay, um, I, am a, I, I am a developmentalist, and I'm a lifespan developmentalist. And what that means is I believe that, well, I know that we continue to develop from conception to death, okay? Oftentimes we only think about little children that are learning to sit up and little children that are learning to crawl and little children that are walking. Those are milestones, aren't they? However, you are in the, in the process of hopefully going to the United States or somewhere else to continue your training, okay? And I hope that you will feel that, let's say that Texas Tech calls and says, we want you to come and be a resident, okay? I hope you feel that that's a milestone that you've accomplished. All right. I am a father of three children. I'm a grandfather. Okay. My oldest grandson is four years old today. So he, he, is, he, is going, he is having a milestone. He's having his fourth birthday. And I'm having a milestone because it was four years ago that I became a grandfather. All right. So I very much believe that we experience and we can change from birth to death. Sometimes as we get older, we don't want to change, but we can. Um, development, um, basically, as I define it, is changes experience due to diff interactions of, of us, phys our physical and our environmental and emotional, physiological, and environment. as I said, environmental influences. All of those impact how we develop as individuals, but that we also develop within the context of relationships. Um, and as I said, all developmental milestones are important. These three gentlemen um, were very, very instrumental in, my, in uh, the Western world in talking about the different stages of development. So it's important that you take a look at er Eric Erickson, Sigmund Freud, and Jean Piaget and have a sense about what they propose in terms of how we develop. Um, Erickson's um, notions were more about um, how we, we develop along a normal path, but that sometimes there are things that will disrupt that and that that can create a crisis and a problem. Sigmund Freud um, viewed developmental stages as being very much uh, influenced by pleasure-giving zones. And then Jean Piaget, who's French, focused primarily upon cognitive or intellectual progress and development across the lifespan, okay? So these gentlemen you should be familiar with and familiar with what they, they postulate as, as human development from birth through death. Um, what influences human development? Genetic contributions that are inherited from our parents, uh, prenatal care, and the experience that, that our moms have. Um, the child's gender will, infect, will affect their development. Uh, a child's temperament, whether a child is shy or a child is outgoing, um, how the child responds to the world, um, 
development is influenced by the, the attachment and bonding that a child experiences, especially a very, very, very young child, an infant. And then finally, degree of stranger separation anxiety will impact that child because it impacts how others relate to them. One of the things that, um, if I were just to look out over the last three or four days and comment on my observations of you folks that have, have listened to all of us, what I would say is, number one, that you're very polite and that you're very, um, not very, but you're somewhat shy to some degree, okay? That's what I would say as a group. I might speculate. However, my guess is if I could get to know each of you, I would be able to see who was more shy, who was less shy, okay? By that I mean who is more outgoing, who is less outgoing, who likes to talk more, who, does, who likes to talk less, okay? And some of that is who we are as people and how we were born and our families and what we experienced. Some of it is what we have, what we have learned, okay? Um, believe it or not, I, always, I have not always liked to talk, okay? When I, was a, when I was a younger child and a teenager, I was very shy. However, being a talk doc, I, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be a good, real good talk doc if I was shy, okay? And, and being in an academic setting, I have to do presentations like this, okay? So if I was really shy, I probably wouldn't even come up here. So I had to learn to not be shy. So there are those things that are learned that, that impact who we are otherwise. Okay, so it's important to realize that and appreciate it. Um, stages of development, uh, you've got the gestational stage, of course, and then birth, uh, where you have sensory skills and reflexes at birth that are important, and we'll talk a bit about, more about this a little later on. Um, infancy, is you, in my, in, in Western world, is considered birth through about 18 months of age, 18 to 24 mo 20 months. Um, one of the things that you notice in children this age is um, smiling, okay? Early on, very young children sometimes will smile, but it may mean that they're passing gas, okay? But because they smile because they're doing that, right? And so it's not intentional, but that's what they do. However, as we, as a, a infant grows, as we grew, uh, we began to spontaneously smile because we would recognize a face. And so that was pleasurable, and so we would smile. Um, and we continued to do that until about four months of age, you have children who start to exhibit laughter. Um, obviously, during this period of time, fine gross motor and language development are crucial, and those are developing. Children are beginning to sit up on their own. They're beginning to crawl. They're beginning to pull up and walk. And so it is, it is vital that you have a sense of how, how Westerners perceive what is normal. But you've got to remember that um, we perceive what is normal developmentally to be within, within um, not right on the, the, the dot, but within normal limits, okay? Uh, toddler phase is considered 18 months to three years. Um, a child this age, between these ages, continues to become more independent. That's what autonomous means. Uh, they also, their vocabulary, their language development, their talking, their babbling um, continues to develop, and they focus a lot about themselves. Um, as I said, in, in the language area, children begin to realize that you can put words together, and that has meaning for the parents, okay? So a, a child begins to realize that rather than having to drag the mom or dad to the uh, pantry to get some fruit or get some candy, usually, the, word be the child begins to realize, I can put, I want candy, three words, or want candy, two words, together, and parents go, oh my goodness, my child is developing. And, and oh, I want, my child wants candy, so let's get, let's get candy for my child. They use, they use their language. So um, kids, kids, as they get older, very, very quickly realize these words have meaning, okay? Um, and in Western, oops, in Western cultures, usually 
uh, by three plus years of age, most children have either begun or completed toilet training. And I'm curious, in Thai, in Thailand, uh, what age do, gen do kids generally start toilet training? When do they generally complete toilet training? Some of my pediatric colleagues? I'm sorry, loud, speak, loud, please. Okay, about the same time then. Okay, so similar in that regard. Um, I would be very, it would be fun to have a conversation about how Thai parents try to help their children learn to be potty trained. Uh, as I told you, I, my oldest grandson is four, four years of age today, and um, he is a very stubborn little boy. He's a very bright little boy. He, he already knows how, to, he gets on his dad's 360 Xbox and plays games, okay? He has no problem doing that. But he doesn't like to go to the bathroom in the toilet. I don't know why, I'm not sure, okay? And it's not a big deal for him, okay? And my, unfortunately, my son and daughter are pulling their hair out trying to get their, their oldest son, who is four, who's very bright, to consistently go to the, the toilet, you know, when he sometimes he just doesn't want to, you know, and they clean him up. So anyway, all right. So it's very similar, but I, like I said, it'd be interesting to have a conversation to see how Thai parents go about helping their children. Uh, preschool is three to six years of age. Uh, the language skills continue to develop and become very important. Language skills are very vital if you think about it in terms of relationship development. Okay? Um, developmentally, in terms of fine and gross motor uh, skills, continue to become more prominent. They continue to be more coordinated in this age period. Um, latency age um, into adolescence. Um, how many of you like to work with adolescents as physicians? Can I? Okay. Does that mean you're all being too shy or nobody likes adolescents? I'm not sure. Anyway, but I, what I will remind you guys is guess what? Weren't you teenagers at one point? Right? Okay. Were you good teenagers? Maybe. Maybe not. Who knows? Right? Okay. So we all pass through that stage. Remember that. Okay, and most of us survive. Um, during this period of time, physical and emotional maturation are becoming more prominent and ongoing. Children and teenagers are becoming more emotionally mature, but they're still not adult-like. They're still more concrete in their thinking, and you have to remember that. Okay? Um, independence, autonomy, and identity development are important during this time, especially in early to middle adolescent years. They're becoming more of themselves. They're, they're deciding how they're going to understand the world and how they're going to act on the world. Um, and then puberty and the development of more adult-like sexuality um, is all obviously, during the teenage years, important. Um, let's talk a bit about the unique experiences that can impact the development of a child into young adulthood, okay? And this will affect how you, how you as physicians work with children and teenagers. You have to appreciate, um, not just physically, but from an emotional standpoint. Oh, and it's, um, when I say I'm going to get on my soapbox now, who understands what that means? Okay, this is, it means this is a big deal for me. And so I'm going to spend just a moment telling you what I think is a big deal. And I've got a lot of big deals, okay? But I think this is important. Sometimes in my field, what I hear is, from a physician, for example, it's not physical, okay? I can't find anything physical that, that explains what's going on. So it must be in their head, meaning it must be emotional or mental, okay? And I'll tell you, that statement used to bother me because I'm trying to figure out, okay, if it's not physical, it, it's in, but it's in, my, it's in the, the person's head, when did the head no longer become physical? Does that make sense? Okay. And so I am very much a, a I, I very much champion, I'm a proponent of understanding that health, good health, overall good health, involves a person being physically well, emotionally well, 
cognitively well and spiritually well. Okay, those are, for me, those are very important. And there's not any difference, okay? Because if, if someone is feeling emotionally, if they're sa very sad, if they're very angry, if they're very anxious, it can affect directly their physical health, can it? We know this. My guess is you know this in, in your country as well. At the same time, if you have a physical illness, such as a chronic illness especially, that can be very, that can dramatically in a negative way affect how you feel emotionally or even cognitively. We know that long-term depression can impact over time our ability to think well. Okay? So that's my soapbox. Health is about being healthy in all areas. Okay? All right. Now, uh, experiences that can impact the developing child. Um, a child who is, is, has to be hospitalized for an extended length of time or has a chronic or life-threatening conditions, and we've talked about many this week, haven't we? Such as cystic fibrosis and other things that can be chronic and can impact the, the overall physical health. Um, a child being born prematurely. We know that if a child is, is premature enough that we, we can speculate that they might, might have problems um, in, in the school age years, okay? We're not sure of exactly why, but we see that connection very often, that prematurity can, can have a negative impact on a child's ability in school later on to learn. Um, failure to thrive would be included in that, mental retardation, obviously. Um, divorce, if, a, if parents are experiencing a lot of difficulties, divorce can affect negatively a child. Um, a child being adopted can, can also have effect upon their development. Uh, my, wife is, uh, my wife was adopted when she was eight days old. She, at eight days, she didn't know that she was adopted. However, she, she on many occasions would tell me that from very, very early on, she realized that there was something different between her and her adopted parents. Her adopted parents are wonderful. My, my parents-in-law were great, great people, okay? But she knew. She knew something was different. My wife is a musician, and she played the piano and the guitar, and she sang. And her adopted parents couldn't sing a bit, okay? They were tone deaf, all right? So um, that can impact a developing child. Um, abuse by significant adults can impact as well. If, if a significant adult in a child's life physically or sexually or emotionally abuses them, that can negatively impact that child's development overall. And then finally, um, risky behaviors in adolescence. And uh, what I mean by risky behaviors is that drug and alcohol abuse, um, premature sexual activity before they're emotionally ready, uh, smoking. I, d I, don't know if sm I, don't, I don't know how significant smoking is in Thailand. Uh, in my country, smoking, and this is one of the questions that you'll have, smoking has been decreasing in, the, in at least the United States for some time. However, over the last number of years, we've seen a slight increase in, in um, adolescent females. We're not sure why, but even though we know that smoking is bad for you, right? I mean, who doesn't know that? You guys all know that, right? You talk to your adult patients about quitting, don't you? However, we still have people that smoke, and in recently, ad adolescent females have, there have been more started starting smoking than in the past. All right, I need to watch my time better. Um, developmental issues at the end of life and death, okay? Issues related to aging, grieving what is normal, as I said, death and dying issues. These you need to be aware of and how they factor into one's overall health as it's seen in, in the Western world, okay? Um, and as I said, this is another, I, I'm very much, um, very much interested in this across the board. Um, and it would be fascinating for me to have a discussion with any, any one of you, any number of you, about in Thailand dying and death issues and how those are handled 
because sometimes in my country, um, older people are not treated as well as they probably should be. Um, causes of death by age. Overall, heart disease and cancer are the most common cause. However, in ages birth to 44 years of age, accidents are the number one cause. Okay? And this is information that just pertains to my country. Maybe similar to yours, but you need to, you need to know it. Um, I won't go into detail with the theories of human development, but these are the important ones to know about. Psychoanalytic theory, and that's Sigmund Freud and others. Learning theory, it's about how we, we learn from our environment and uh, other things. Um, I'm, a, I'm a talk doc, I'm a psychotherapist. Um, I, am, I do more of this, cognitive and behavioral therapy. I'm a brief therapist in that I don't work with people for many years on a, on a week by week basis. But what I may do is I may have contact with a child or children in a family um, over a number of years. I may work with them for a couple of, for two or three months. I may help them move beyond whatever difficulty they're experiencing. And then um, six months later they may call me and say, we're, we're having a bit of trouble now again. Can we, can we come in and see you? I said, sure. Okay. Um, psychoanalysis, according, uh, Sigmund Freud initially started psychoanalysis, but there's many others that have, have put their own brand on psychoanalysis. Cognitive and behavioral therapy tends to be a briefer therapy. It also tends to be focused on how to change your behaviors. Um, there's other assorted therapies, assertive tr assertiveness training and behavioral rehearsal. Biofeedback is fascinating. Um, in my country, especially in, in the area that I, that I enjoy most, the notion of mindfulness, meditation, um, some of the, the, some of the uh, thoughts of Buddha are becoming very important in how we think we can help people. Okay? And biofeedback is, is a, a way of becoming more relaxed using a machine to help guide you. Okay? I am also a, um, I do hypnotherapy, okay, I do hypnosis, and um, some people look at me like, oh my God, you're terrible, right? Hypnosis, and, and I use, personally, I use hyp hypnotherapy in a sense for myself whenever I get ready to come up. Remember I told you I used to be a little shy kid? I used to be a little shy fat kid, which is worse, okay? Anyway, when I prepare to, to give a talk, I always spend a few minutes using self-hypnosis to calm myself down and get myself prepared. Okay, so it, it's powerful. And I said, as I said, biofeedback is a way of achieving a calm, relaxed state using a machine. Um, systematic desensitization, it's important that you have a sense about that and how that's used in to, to extinguish a behavior. Uh, it's more, uh, more of the direct behavioral therapy. Um, all right. Um, I probably won't, I'm not going to go through this much because I think Dr. Decha will probably spend more time. But basically, as I said earlier, psycho, uh, psychiatric disorders, know, have a sense of them, have a sense of the DSM-4, okay, and the criteria to be diagnosed with major depression, for example, or schizophrenia. Um, know that the um, DSM-4 system is, is divided into five axes, and it's based on biological, psychological, and social understanding and model, okay? And some of it you just have to memorize. Some of it you just have to know. Um, and first and foremost, what I remind you, the difficulty in my field in diagnosing is that I can't get inside a person's head, okay? I can't walk up to you and put my fingers on your skull and go, I'm inside his head. I can't do that. Some, some teenagers that I work with, they claim that I can do that, so they, they don't like to come see me, but, but I can't, okay? I, my diagnosing is based on observations of a person and their behavior along with getting to know that person and getting to know how that person is, okay? And it's a, it's a very, very, very educated guess, but it's a guess, 
I've been doing this for 30 years. And I've experienced many different behaviors. But it's still a guess. And it's one thing to be able to observe what someone does. It's another thing to then begin trying to decide why they're doing it. Okay, and that's part of the challenge, I think, in my country. Because we have um, a number of diagnoses for children that I have some question about. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, all right, real quickly, uh, Axis 1 is a psychiatric or psychological disorders, uh, but excluding personality disorders and mental retardation. Axis 2, and this is, once again, this is DSM-4 criteria for diagnosing mental health issues. Um, Axis 2, uh, you, you address any personality issues or mental retardation, if any present. Um, Axis 3, you are to comment on, on the patient's general medical condition overall. Axis 4, any psychosocial or environmental issues. For children, for example, you would put parents are divorced. Are, uh, what, would go, what else would go here is that um, children are, have been abused by adults. Okay? Those are the issues in five. And then, I mean, yeah, in four. And then axis five, you are to give a guess about the prognosis for this patient. Okay? What, how likely are they to be able to, with help, either with medication or with talk therapy, how likely they are to be able to become um, more emotionally adjusted, better well-adjusted emotionally. Uh, so know those. Mental health, mental status exam, I know that Dr. Pisat talked about that. It's important. It basically is the part of your physical examination that gives you a sense about how that person is functioning emotionally and mentally, okay? Um, we won't go into it, but it's on the DVD. Um, personality disorders, that's axis two. It's important that you understand those and have a sense about what they are. Um, Psychiatric disorders in children and teenagers, and this is where, this is where I live a lot, since as I said I work with children and teenagers, um, and it can be bro broken up roughly into four different groups. Um, in my, in our country, in, in my country, in the Western world, primarily in America, this particular diagnosis has become very, very important: attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So it's vital that you have a sense about that. Okay. Um, before I moved strictly into talk therapy, I did psychological assessing. And, and this slide is about the different types of psychological assessment. It's important that you have a sense about that. Because as primary care physicians, for example, you might get psychological evaluations, especially about a child. So you need to have an understanding of that. I won't go with this, over this in detail, but it is on the slide. I mean, it is on the DVD. Um, psychosomatic medicine, um, you will see many, many, many patients whose physical well-being are impacted by their psychological or emotional well-being. Okay? And I, sp I spoke briefly about my soapbox, remember? And this is the part that where our two worlds very much join sig very significantly. Um, currently, I work in a clinic side by side with a nurse practitioner who's a pediatrician. And so she focuses, because of her expertise, on the physical well-being of the child. And if, if she's concerned about their emotional well-being or cognitive well-being, she'll call me in. And so we work hand in glove. We, we work very closely together because we know how significant the two can interact with each other. Um, these are some statistics that, about my country that, I would, that may or may not be true for your country. Um, our country can be a violent country. Unfortunately, especially teenagers who kill themselves, as do adults. Suicide is a significant, um, is a significant challenge in my country. Um, homicide, obviously, is a significant challenge as well. Um, as I said, familiarize yourself with the demographics of, of homicide in my country, because you will be asked uh, some about that. Um, accidents are the third leading cause, actually the fifth leading cause of death overall, if you remember, under 44. Um, and most of those accidents are motor vehicles. Um, substance abuse has for a long time been a challenge in my country. Substance abuse use and abuse. Um, 
it's important that you, and this last one, uh, and there's a question that we'll go over. Alcohol and tobacco in my country are the most commonly used and or abused, okay? It's not the street drugs or not the, actually there's a lot of people that um, abuse uh, prescribed drugs too. You have to be careful about that as a physician. Um, sleep. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail with this because you can get this information off this slide. Sleep is a very underappreciated, um, in my country, it's very underappreciated as a cause of difficulties both physically and emotionally. Okay? Recent sleep studies indicate that children need between eight and nine hours of sleep a night on average, and that you, us, adults, we probably need seven to eight hours. Now, how many of you get seven to eight hours of sleep regularly? Nobody, right? And unfortunately, what we're finding is that we, in my country, we are a, becoming a country of sleep-deprived people. And we know that that can negatively affect physical well-being as, as well as emotional well-being, okay? Sometimes the children I work with have very erratic sleep patterns and they don't get enough sleep. And so what, one of the things we know is that if you don't get enough sleep consistently, it's, it may be difficult for you to focus, to attend. And that could be an explanation for a child having difficulty doing that in school. So sleep is a, another soapbox item of mine, okay? It's vital that you appreciate the, the power and importance of sleep and how it can affect you negatively if you don't get enough sleep. And also, one other tidbit. Um, oftentimes people say, oh, on the weekend I'll get caught up. You know, I'll sleep 10 or 12 hours over the weekend, right? You don't get, you cannot catch up, okay? You cannot catch up what you've missed. That's what we're finding out in sleep studies. Um, some more sleep facts that are important for you to know. Um, different sleep disorders, narcolepsy, a night terror, sleep paralysis. Um, this, along with having a sense about, in my country, um, how the, the health care is delivered, I think it's important that you appreciate, at least from the Western viewpoint, the importance of the physician-patient relationship. We could talk about this for an entire, entire hour or two, but I won't. It's vital that as a physician, I think anywhere, that you develop, you have a, an effective way of communicating with your patients. In my country, more and more physicians are called upon to be, to guide patients more so than say, okay, you're going to do this or else, okay? And so there's much more of a collaboration between the physician and the patient. At the same time, you guys have information about, a phys about a, your patient's physical well-being, okay? So it's important that you make sure that your patient knows what you think is important for them to do, okay? In my country, it's just become more of pay, physicians cannot tell patients, you're going to do this or else, okay? So the physician-patient relationship is a vital one. Um, this is some more. Um, this slide talks a bit about the health care in the United States. Once again, as I said, it's important that you take a look at that and know that. Um, what are the problems? There's many. We're trying to solve them um, with some success or with sometimes not little, much success. Um, talking about the solutions. Um, yes, okay. Epidemiology, I really won't, I, as a researcher, as an academician, I have to be a researcher to some degree and epidemiology is important in terms of research. So have a sense about what, what that is, and you probably already know that, um, but at least know about it for in preparation for uh, the step one. All right, um, you have a slide with books to consider, okay? Help books for the different USMLEs. I would suggest that you uh, take a look at those, and uh, you may find one that you like. Understand, is Kaplan, you can get the Kaplan course in Bangkok now, is that, is that what someone told me? Okay. Um, Malik, my Sudanese resident, said that he used Kaplan. He didn't go to the course, he just got the book, and he said it was very helpful. So uh, that's a tidbit directly from a, uh, uh, from a, a fellow colleague and fellow physician. All right, um, I ran a little bit long. It's a little bit after 11. Let's take a five-minute break, 
and uh, then we'll start doing questions and answers, and at the end, we'll answer whatever question you may have, okay? I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate your attentiveness, so take a, take a quick break, and we'll start back in five minutes, okay?